So what we've been seeing, and, and thank you for asking, is we, we have always known that IOP fluctuates and it fluctuates during the day, it fluctuates over weeks, it fluctuates over months. We initially started using the eye care home because we suspected that patients who were progressing with normal pressures in the office may have be having pressure spikes outside of the office. And in fact, that was very much true. Patients that I thought were controlled on maximum medication were actually spiking into the 20s. And what that told me was that they were not controlled. And what that enabled was decisions to actually take that patient either to surgery sooner, laser, or change their medications. From that information, we have now even taken a step back. And when a patient comes to me for a consult, I ask them basically to use the eye care home and give me a week's worth of readings. And that enables me to see what if in fact they're spiking, what is that maximum IOP? And then even more importantly is fluctuation. Going back into the literature, we have so much evidence that fluctuation is in fact an independent risk factor, regardless of that maximum IOP. And that's really where the research now is trending at the Moran. We have a lot of assumptions. Uh, we're seeing pressure spikes in some cases into high 20s, and I had a patient who was spiking into the 30s that we did not know. And every time she was in my office, her pressures were 17 and 18. So again, seeing that pressure spike enabled me to be much more proactive, and she elected to do an SLT laser in that eye that was spiking. We know it's early in the morning, there's uh, a lot of research that came out of the 1970s from a uh, endocrinologist around the role of cortisol. We know exercise can affect IOP, stress, um, volume, water drinking increases IOP, position. But I think in different pa patients, I think it's different. There's going to be different triggers and uh, different reasons for that pressure spiking and that fluctuation. So again, you know, when you look at the literature, going back to the SIGIT study, so the SIGIT study, the nine-year data, actually showed that 8.5 millimeters of mercury in terms of a delta, the difference between the low and the high, actually was an independent risk factor regardless of what that patient's baseline was. But we never had the ability to actually monitor or follow fluctuation. We always had a static one-time point in the office reading. And we talked about fluctuation or changes between office visits, but it's very different from what we're seeing on a diurnal variability. And it does, it looks like an EKG. You know, these patients' pressures will go up and down. And again, what we're, again, this is a hypothesis, but based on the literature, the concern is probably the delta rather than the absolute number. So I'm getting the sense that perhaps going from 24 to 26 is not as concerning as going from 10 to 20. Eventually, you know, in talking to some, many of my colleagues in the US, whether it's at Wilmer, Wills, Duke, the Moran, we're starting to see that if you have glaucoma, why not monitor your IOP on a regular basis? You know, it's sort of, it's similar to asking if you're a diabetic, why are you not monitoring your, your glucose, right? It's that type of information. Originally, I used it as a diagnostic tool. Um, more and more, I'm using it as a monitoring tool. A lot of my colleagues are using it pre and post surgery. I see this instrument being very helpful in our sustained release IOP lowering agents, right? We know the drops are gonna perhaps stop working. Patients are using these sustained devices. When will those pressures start to creep up? This would be a great way to monitor and see that change in IOP over time. So I think everybody. 
Yes, very easy to use. And in fact, there's a red light. The patient just centers it. The two prongs rest around the patient's eye. It turns green and you just look straight ahead, press the button, and this little probe will then almost instantaneously touch the cornea and measure the IOP. It takes several readings and it'll average it. No anesthetics. We have found that even a lot of my elderly patients um, with Parkinson's arthritis, with the help of a spouse, caregiver, can actually take their measurements. And this, I get asked this question all the time. And like anything, we go back to what we're comfortable with. We're comfortable with Goldman. Goldman is not that reliable. Goldman has inherent um, issues in reliability and repeatability. And in fact, the rebound tonometry, which is uh, the technology that this is based on, has been around 20, 30 years. We use it in drug development. The FDA, the EMA, regulatory agents trust these measurements when they're developing drugs, when it's being tested on animals. And the reliability is excellent. Um, there's been numerous studies that have been done looking at repeatability, reliability, um, sensitivity, and again, within the range of, you know, probably 10 to 12, up to low 20s, it's very close to a Goldman reading. So we have now had 300 patients uh, within the Wilmer system and Moran. And we sent a questionnaire to actually ask the patients this exact, this exact question. Patients feel empowered. You know, I will hear from patients all the time, wow, I missed a drop, my pressure went up, I can see that the medication's working, or my pressures are spiking, I'm obviously not being controlled, let's talk about management. I want that laser. I want to have surgery because I see that I'm not controlled. So it really empowers the patient and it makes the patient now part of the solution. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's been life-changing for many of my patients with severe disease. It's a very complex disease. I tell my patients that it's a wastebasket. You know, in some ways we call it glaucoma. Glaucoma is different in different people with different underlying pathologies, different in, uh, etiologies. And it also, I have seen it become more uh, personalized. You know, we are now doing GWAS studies. We're trying to understand the genetics, um, inheritance patterns, secondary causes. but. When everything comes down to it, the only way that we can still treat glaucoma is to lower the pressure. And that's why even if there's different causes, we still have one management you know, approach. And the more information you have on what that pressure is, you can better tail you know, the, um, the treatment. But it's a, it's a devastating disease. I've got a lot of younger patients who you know, are losing vision from it. Um, and it's a challenge. It's very complex.